Hello, I'm River. Welcome to New Kingdom Media. And joining me today is Craig Truglia, whose YouTube channel is Orthodox Christian Theology. Hi, Craig. How are you doing? I'm good. It's uh, good to be here. This is a, a, a really fun topic. Yes, it is. Uh, and I feel like between your channel, my channel, and Paul Facey's channel, we're talking about the issue of canonicity in a way that not many other people on YouTube are, I'd say, um, that I've seen. So it is exciting. So, uh, yep, we're talking about canonicity today. Uh, we've got Craig here to give us the Eastern Orthodox perspective on the issue. We'll be talking about that and how that interacts with the Anglican perspective and what the differences are and what the similarities are between how we approach this issue. So let's just get straight into it, I, I'd say, Craig. Um, the first question I have for you is, in terms of YouTube apologetics, we often, as uh, we being people like me, Protestants, we often get the argument that under sola scriptura, uh, we can't have an infallible knowledge of the canon of scripture because the Bible itself doesn't give you a list of what books are in the Bible. And therefore, Protestants can't have any kind of epistemic certainty about what the canon is. And apparently, therefore, the whole sort of system falls apart. So my first question is, Craig, do you think that's a good argument for Eastern Orthodox Christians to make against Protestants? Would you make that yourself? I, I would say yes and no. And here's what I mean. It's not a good argument in as much as the Orthodox don't have a singularly settled canon. So it'd be kind of the cut your nose off to spite your face sort of argument. And if you want my wild guess, I would I would guess that even Roman Catholics 100 years from now may refine their view of what they think their canon is uh, in light of just, I think, increased dialogue with Orthodox and ecumenical dialogue with Protestants. There's been a minority view within Roman Catholicism, but there are a few names, I don't have them memorized though, of people saying, well, the Deuterocanon doesn't mean the books are exactly the same as the rest of the canon. And mm -hmm. so once you open that door, it starts becoming closer to Anglicans, closer to Orthodox, if you allow that door to be open. You don't hear that in apologetics, but it's something that uh, scholarly, and this is over centuries, not even like liberals in the last 50 years or something, that scholarly Roman Catholics have been um, floating around for centuries. And so in that sense, it's just not a good argument because arguably the Roman Catholics would not have this view that their canons is settled as you may think. And the Orthodox certainly don't. But yeah. let me just say, well, what in that argument is at least worth considering? I think that we get very hung up on epistemic certainty more than what a faith-based religion should really allow us to be. And so being that that's the case, like, okay, we don't have epistemic certainty or, you know, in none of us have infallibility, right? Yeah. You could err, I could err, right? So we all individually aren't infallible people. But for just for the sake of speaking like a normal human being, do we have any doubt whatsoever the Gospel of John is scripture? No, right? So like there are some things where we should have moral certainty that yes, it's canon, right? Mm -hmm. And so we could make the argument that yes, there are certain things that Christians ought to have absolute moral certainty, but I do agree with you. The uh the canon of scripture, whether it's 66 books, whether it's 73 books, 74 books, somewhere in between, whatever, um, the moral certainty of what the number is, is not a good argument because we don't have that moral certainty. This is by way of concession. People should understand that 66 is actually a very good, historically respectable number when we're speaking mm -hmm. of the fathers and of recent saints, particularly on Russian Orthodox with the Russian Orthodox saints, uh, for example, St. Philip of Moscow, in his updated translation of the Confession of Dositheus, those who aren't aware, Confession of Dositheus gives a pretty standard 73 book, maybe 74 book canon, because of how it speaks to the books of Maccabees. Yeah. And when St. Philip translated it, he purposely left out the part of canon because he taught a 66 book canon in his catechism. Um, new martyr Daniel Sezoyev, who's a 21st century Russian saint, not yet canonized, but he's he's clearly being venerated and he will ultimately be canonized. 
He gives a 66 book canon. Uh, St. Nikolai Izika, a Serbian saint who uh, is a Holocaust survivor and died in the United States in Pennsylvania, he also gave a 66 book canon. So it's to me bizarre and it shows a lack of understanding of even the recent Orthodox tradition, let alone digging up relics the past like St. Jerome or whatever. Where 66 is a very popular number throughout Christian history. So if someone has a 66 book canon, it's, I don't see the problem with it. In fact, it's probably the most accurate number that, like, uh, what's it? I think mode, when we deal the law of averages, there's mean, median, and mode. I think that's mm -hmm. the mode, if we would go with the historical averages, would be 66. So sure. it, yeah. it's it's a very reasonable number and, and selection of books to arrive at. It's by no means unreasonable. Okay. Well, yeah, I, 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 I've certainly never heard an Eastern Orthodox Christian say that before, because usually uh, there's a, a real need to defend a larger canon and sort of maintain that that's the standard Orthodox position. But yeah, when I did some reading into it, I, I discovered to my shock that, yeah, the Eastern Orthodox don't have an officially set number of books in their canon, which, which changed my perspective on all this. Okay, right. So th thanks for talking about that a bit. Let's Let's just get into how the Eastern Orthodox Church then does understand what the canon of Scripture is in terms of the number of books. So, from correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, essentially in the ecumenical councils, the seven ecumenical councils the Eastern Orthodox Church affirms, there are six canons of Scripture contained in those documents that are given ecumenical approval, which is infallible in the Eastern Orthodox mindset. And so since those six canons don't actually across the board agree, uh, there is some wriggle room as it comes to the canon. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, it would be the very short answer, but let me give a little more details. I don't have the exact number memorized as in uh, how yeah. many are in the councils. Like I think Ancyra gives one, Apostolic Canons give one, Council of Carthage mm -hmm. gives one, and that's just the top of my head. But we also have... Uh, a canon of scripture given by the Confession of Dositheus, which is a pan-Orthodox document uh, that's accepted in the, between the 17th and 18th century. So we got a, a canon of scripture there. And the Orthodox have a broader view of tradition where if we have, let's say, uh, saints like St. Saint Philaret giving a straight up 66 book canon, if we have uh, another saint like St. Saint John of Damascus, an exposition Orthodox faith, gives yet another modified canon, which is none of these, that we don't go, oh, well, that's not a, you know, a conciliar document, so that means nothing. It, our tradition is, is much more broad than that. And so we could discuss at some point in this conversation exactly how we discern the differences in these canons. And, but I think the, at the core of this is, in a sense, by preserving all of the traditions we preserve more truth than trying to just artificially cut out what is likely the best one, right? So a good a comparison that could be made, even if you don't agree with the theory of the textual uh, formation of, let's say, the books of Moses, would be that, well, the books of Moses may incorporate varying traditions that are threaded into it, and people uh, know these uh, hypotheses that there's a priestly source, this source, that source. For what it's worth, the Orthodox tradition is that uh, St. Ezra actually reconstituted the whole Old Testament, that it was essentially lost and reconstituted by Ezra. So it's interesting that the Orthodox tradition actually aligns pretty closely to some of these more modern theories of these like textual reformation of of scriptural text. So it's it's not totally anathema for us anyway. But that being said, if we just accept the premise that, well, God, you know, God gave the Holy Spirit to men of the ages to not only write the traditions, and eventually someone put pen to paper and wrote down what Moses said and what other people after Moses said and made the books of Moses. Well, in that in that event, what's the best way to do it? To do it like the Quran? and get rid of all the variants and get rid of all 
all the things that appear contradictory. And even they didn't do a good job of that, by the way, the Quran. But, you know, get rid of stuff that appears contradictory because we don't want things to look problematic. Or do we keep everything in, even if it appears on the surface to contradict, because that preserves our entire tradition, our, our entire spiritual inheritance? You know, I, for one, am happy that the you know, that we didn't harmonize the numbers in First and Second Chronicles with Second Kings, that sometimes there are different numbers with numbers of soldiers and stuff like that, because it shows that the the traditions that we had are preserved. And I believe God has preserved them the way they are for a reason. Doesn't mean they're, that's always easily discernible. And so applying that to the canon, it's not a problem for us if they appear on paper to overtly contradict because it's not whether it's right or it's wrong. That's not how we look at it because we don't look at our own tradition that way. We don't have like there's the Bible, but then the prayers of the church or the liturgy or the writings of the saints or the conciliar minutes or the decrees of councils or the canons are somehow different. We see them as part of a whole. They have qualitative differences, but they're still part of a whole, which we call sacred tradition. Sure. And it, to give a Protestant uh, perspective on that too. Of course, we don't have that same view that we would put tradition and scripture together in sacred tradition. But if you look at e even the Gospels, for instance, there are points in which they don't line up perfectly, especially between John and the Synoptics, unless you do various <laughs> methods to try and get them to match up perfectly. And so I you think it's see in somewhere in Acts of the Apostles where he actually says, like, seven or nine days like he doesn't even give the exact number <laughs> he gives yeah, it to what yeah, was right. this or the other i can't remember yeah 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 that's <laughs> it and uh so we've got different traditions preserved from different eyewitness accounts that don't line up perfectly and that's not an issue for us we have this sort of robotic uh post enlightenment need for complete certainty about everything and that's just not really the biblical perspective on it i'd say uh, I think we with, with the fathers open. they did make things like gospel harmonies they would try to explain how things that appear different to surface do harmonize in some way. But we also have saints that will just not do that. Like St. Maximus will, I forget which detail it was in like second Kings or something, but he pretty much, he could figure out other parts of the, of the Bible that let's say a certain geographic location is being mislocated or something. And St. Maximus says, God left errors in the Bible to make us aware that we are not to take a literal interpretation, but rather to start looking for the allegory in the passage. Now, I'm not saying you have to agree with that. My point in that example is that this idea where everything always factually lines up at every single point, historically, scientifically, it's just, it seems to me more of a fundamentalist thing in recent times. I don't say that in the pejorative. I'm just saying this is, this is where it comes from, right? Like people looking for dinosaurs in the Bible sort of stuff. And it doesn't mean that the fathers and Christians historically didn't think the scriptures were historically accurate, because obviously they did, but they just didn't approach it in the same, like, extremely exacting sort of yeah, hyper-obsessive right. way that we do today. I agree. And I am a, I'm a biblical literate, so I, I believe in a real Adam and Eve, and I believe Adam and Eve lived about 6,000-ish years ago and that sort of thing, but I also, yeah, don't go into that fundamentalist mentality of having to be exact about everything. But and looking so back people, at And so people are aware, yeah, I, I do as well when it comes to like, do I believe there's an Adam and Eve? Yes, there's an Adam and Eve and stuff like that. It's just that we have to pull from the scriptures the the emphasis that's intended. Are they looking mm -hmm. for you to like exactly figure out scientific questions and all this other stuff? Or mm. like is Genesis 1 about god's creation of the church god's separating of good and evil and in these larger threads that run through the scriptures is that what's the more important emphasis and obviously it's that not like literally counting how many days of creation even there literally were i don't think that's the main thing we're supposed to walk away with it yeah that's right yeah so just to go back to these six canons canon lists that are approved in the east orthodox church they all agree on you know, the main the main canon, the main sort of homo legumina of the New Testament and the Hebrew canon. But where we get differences is, for instance, in the books of Maccabees, only the canon of the, is it the um, apostolic constitution or something? Um, only in that canon is the books of Maccabees listed. 
all the other five canons don't list it. Um, also, only in the canon of Carthage is, for instance, the Book of Wisdom, the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, listed, whereas the others don't list it. And then even for Revelation, uh, only two canons, or only two canon lists have Revelation in it, which is Carthage and, Ath- and Athanasios. So just, just so that we can understand a bit more about the East Norfolk's perspective, are we saying that for the books that all of the canon lists approve, so for instance, all of them will have Genesis in it, that a Orthodox Christian must have what you call moral certainty about Genesis. But when it comes Actually, to something absolutely. like... Absolutely. A consensus tradition is, for us, epistemically, the only thing that's certain. Yeah. But since only one canon lists the book of Maccabees, does that mean that an Orthodox Christian is permitted to have a degree of uncertainty about that and to say that's not something that we're... That we wouldn't be on. how we approach it precisely. I know It makes sense from the Western paradigm to approach it that way. The way we would approach it is if it's missing from some, why? Not because it's not scripture, but how is it different than the others? And that, mm-hmm. and so what we would approach that as that there's some sort of qualitative difference. Um, and so like for me, uh, it helps me to unpack this a little bit just by even uh, covering some of the earliest canon. So like the earliest canon I think we have whatsoever, it's a – it's a fight between Melito, St. Melito of Sardis and the Muratorian Fragment, depending on how you date them. They're pretty much probably almost exactly the same time, in all honesty. And so, like, a very uh, curious thing about uh, St. Melito is he includes wisdom. Now, wisdom what? Probably wisdom of Solomon. And so he just puts that in the middle of all the other Old Testament books. So if we just read that one source, it sounds like he thinks it's just like every other Old Testament book. But the Muratorian fragment, it gives the New Testament, and after giving all the New Testament books, where the book Revelation is excluded, it then gives the book of wisdom, and to read the fragment, written by the friends of Solomon in his honor. So it obviously puts it at the end of the canon, because it's obviously not actually written by Solomon. So apparently that knocks it down a peg, right? And it's not in the Old Testament because they knew it was an Old Testament. And they put it after all the New Testament books, they knew it was a New Testament. So this implies anyway that there's something about Wisdom of Solomon that's just not quite like the other books where we can list it just in between. That's what that implies. Now, let me build a historical case of why this implication is compelling. Um, we start seeing in a lot of early sources, these are third century sources, where they start using euphemisms for these books that don't tend to make it in all the canons like you've mentioned. So like Apostolic uh, Canon 85 says, for the younger, wisdom is Sirach. Go, wait, what's it talking about? It gives the whole canon, and then it says, for the younger, wisdom is Sirach, meaning the catechumens. Right, so it's a book used for catechizing, like Saint Athanasius literally talks about, but it somehow doesn't meet the the criteria of canon as the other books would. It w- it's it should be only a uh, a catechetical work, for example, is what Epistle Canon eighty five says. Now, like Origen, for example, when he gives his canon, he says he gives literally, I think it's like a 65 book canon, if I remember right. It's pretty much the same thing as, you know, the Protestant canon, you know, again, that that popular 66 book canon. And he says, and outside of these, there are the Maccabees. Right. So he's well, they're outside somehow. He includes them, but they're not quite the same. Like they're they're in the ends. Now, here's my favorite. St. Athanasius, I think he puts it clearest. So it's not whether we have moral doubt with this canonical or not. St. Athanasius calls them the canonical and the readable. I'm going to repeat that. The canonical and the readable. So there's these scriptures that meet the, this highest bar where, you know, not only this moral certitude, they're the most important, but there's other books that we must read, but they don't meet that same bar. And so... This would be hard to infer because, let's say, in the 73rd book, the 73 book canon that the Council of Carthage later gives, that's the one that, let's say, Roman Catholic apologists like uh, 
pointing to because it's the earliest authority that matches with Trent. Um, it just all it says is they're read in the church, right? That these 73 books are read in the church, it means they're used liturgically. And so it would be correct to say if it's read liturgically, that means that it carries a special authority. You don't just read random books liturgically. But I just want people to be aware that's not as ironclad of an argument as people think. The Proto-Evangelicum of James was read liturgically. Let me name a book that no one's ever heard of, um, which is John Geometri's Life of the Virgin was read liturgically for several centuries. I'm sure you never heard of this. I'm sure everyone listening to this never heard of this because pretty much only Marian scholars know the existence of this book. <laughs> you know, so... That was read liturgically. So just being read liturgically doesn't in of itself prove that the book is, you know, sacred scripture, God breathed as it talks about 2 Timothy 3.16. Doesn't prove that. What it does prove, it's part of the Orthodox tradition. It's not negotiable as part of that tradition, but it's qualitatively different than God breathed scripture. And this is something which, because this is a very long aside, I'm going to stop. But this is actually the exact criteria that's given by, um, or at least quoted by, St. Nicodemus Hagiorite in The Rudder, which is probably our most recent authoritative canonical source on this sort of issue. Great. Well, thank you for all that. So I'm, I'm, I think we're going to get more into The Rudder a little bit later. So you opened up a few threads that I think we'll return to. But just before we do that, um, before we spend a lot of time talking about exactly all the differences between the Deuterocanonical books and the other books. Um, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, what is what we would call the criteria for canonicity? So what makes a book scripture? Or to, be, to put it better, how does the Eastern Orthodox Church decide that something is scripture? So, so for instance, some classic criteria would be um, a, a, apostolicity, or ap that's a hard word to say, isn't it? Um, apostolic authorship or apostolic origin, or another one might just be simply traditional acceptance that we can see that many church fathers and canonists believed it, or liturgical use, which we've already looked at a little bit, or another another one, this is a liberal criteria for canonicity that I don't think we would have, which is that simply does it bear witness to Christ, and if it does, then it's scripture, if it doesn't, then they say it's not, and then they'll have all kinds of ideas about maybe some of it is witnesses to Christ and some of it isn't, so they can sort of chop it up. Um, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, what would be the main criteria for canonicity? That's actually a very good question, because here's what it's not, and this kind of circles back to what you kind of began this discussion with, which is what it's not is it's not some exercise in arbitrary church ultramontanist power to just decide, because we say so, this makes it the Bible, right? That's actually the whole point of the epistemic certainty argument. And it's just really not what's going on. <laughs> the What the councils are theoretically doing is through the grace of the Holy Spirit, accepting and recognizing what the tradition always was, right? This is what it always was. So like when St. Clement quotes most of the Bible in his one letter, right? Doesn't mean all of it, but most of it, he's just accepting what it was, right? This isn't some magical exercise and decreeing, boom, that's Bible. Or in whether it's the corpus of St. Ignatius or in St. Ignatius Against Heresies, you can pretty much find, I think actually in Against Heresies, every single book the Bible is quoted in that book. And so you could surmise the canon from that book because he quotes it as scripture and it's all, all in that book. That wasn't, it wasn't like some sort of magical, I am in the church, and by me doing this, this declares it as scripture. No, he was just repeating what he what was be given to him, right? This is all he knew as the canon, was what he, was given to him. And so all the councils are doing is the same exact exercise, but in a synodical setting. That, that's all that is. Yeah, and I so, think that's a good point to bring up, because a, a lot of Eastern Orthodox apologists I've seen on YouTube have this sort of idea that the ecumenical councils were the ones who said who made it the, the canon rather than recognize the canon. And that's why you can have epistemic certainty about it because they're infallible or something. And that even that, that still doesn't even quite work because of what we looked at where the ecumenical councils don't give us the same official canon anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, keep going. But yeah. So like, yes, it, it puts to waste 
that very silly epistemic certainty argument. And really what the Protestants have is very similar to what the Orthodox have, which is at this point, right, because this is centuries removed from Protestant Reformation, it's just this is what I've received. This is what every book of the Bible I've ever picked up has in the table of contents. And that's actually completely appropriate. I, I would I would venture to guess that a Protestant wouldn't say the table of contents is decreed by God because they know it's the publisher put it there, right? Mm -hmm. But they would say, well, it's not a coincidence that this is what we have and what we all have. I'm sure they'd see this is something that God superintended, that God permitted to occur, and that that gives a sort of a moral certainty in its own right. And so that sort of approach is very analogous to, again, how the Orthodox approach is. This is what, he, what we received from this council, and here's what we received from this council, and here's what we received from this saint. And so this is what we've got from our inheritance. And that's what gives us moral certainty, which is our inheritance is, is a, a little bit more diverse in that respect. Now, that being said, though, I think the actual answer to your question is something you've probably even heard Protestant apologists give. So like with the Old Testament, the criteria for the Old Testament, for example, by St. Augustine is whether the books were laid up in the temple. I mean, right, I've heard James White say this, but this is a criteria that St. Augustine takes for granted, you know, that they're the books laid up in the temple. What other books would be of the Old Testament? And I actually, you know, uh, Orthodox hat off, historian hat on. From what I can, from my reading of early Jewish sources, I think only the books of Moses were technically in the temple. And technically the temple was under the control of the Sadducees, which only accepted the books of Moses. So it's, if this were 100% true, at least historically speaking, I think all of us have major problems. But I'm, mm. just, re I'm just repeating what – this is what St. Augustine takes for granted. And he's not the only guy who says this. He talks about in City of God. Um, elsewhere, I think it's on the in the book on predestination of the saints. It might be in, in on perseverance of the saints. I forget which, but in one of the books he makes mention of the wisdom of Solomon, he acknowledges that it really wasn't written by Solomon. But he says it's canonical because by the church's acceptance of it, it gets the force of custom, if I remember the verbiage right. And so essentially, and this is bizarre from the Protestant paradigm and probably Roman Catholics, at least in the West, because they're not dealing with it this way, but right but the force of custom makes it almost like scripture. It's like, but if you ever notice, Orthodox will quote their own hymns like as if they're scripture. We'll quote our own saints like they're like scripture. We quote all sorts of authorities like they're like scripture. And so it wouldn't be bizarre within that paradigm to go, all right, well, if everyone just treats this like scripture, even though it wasn't laid up in the temple, by the force of custom, it becomes scripture. I don't think so, that's that um, unacceptable to a Protestant. So I think... A good way to, for me to approach, in my, a good way to approach the Old Testament canon from my point of view is that we we start with Jesus, right? Of course, that's who our faith is ultimately in, and Jesus obviously affirms the canon of Scripture of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, not every book of the of even the Hebrew canon is quoted. So, for instance, Ecclesiastes and Esther are never quoted in the New Testament. But I don't think you'll you'll meet many Orthodox Protestants who wouldn't think those are scripture. And so why, why have they just assumed those are scripture? Well, basically just because they're assuming that since the new Testament quotes from all the other books of the Hebrew canon, they must have believed those ones are too, simply because that was the custom. Now, no one's going to claim that Ecclesiastes and Esther were in the temple because they obviously weren't. So it seems to be that custom for those books is basically the only criteria for canonicity there is. We just know from history that the Jews believed those books, well, not all of them, most of them believed those books were part of scripture. And so because of that custom, that Jewish custom, we do too. So I think this is, this is why a big reason why I wanted to do this, this interview, because I think Protestants do need to recognize that uh, even in our own system, tradition is a is an important part of canonicity but since we're saying in, in protestantism since we say that tradition's not infallible that does mean that we also have to recognize that certain books we can't have epistemic certainty that they're inspired 
but that seems to be sort of more or less what we're kind of both saying in, in some ways. Yeah, I'd say the main difference is that we would view our tradition as infallible and we ref- and we would view the diversity in the tradition as true, even if not on face value, right? And so like I was alluding to before, when we start getting to these differences in canons, it appears to be what the ones that aren't the, I forget you used the word with the ones that are all the same in every single diverse canon and every single tradition. Yeah, in the New Testament, we call that the homo legumina. Homo I legumina. Know, we, 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 we don't have a word for that, the Old Testament. Um, but yeah. so for, let's say, the we'll just call it the fuzzy fringes at 15% that, yeah. you know, where really among the 15, it's it's like, it's most time it's much smaller. It's like, you know, it's 5% that really are very often, you know, not. But mm-hmm. within that small fraction, it's... The Orthodox Church say, well, there's canonical and readable. So if it's within the fuzzy fringes, it's not that it's not readable. It's just not going to meet the same exacting criteria that the canonical books would meet. Um, the silliest way I've heard it put, maybe this sounds funny in, in English translation from the Russian, is canonical. Uh, it was canonical scriptures and non-canonical, non-canonical scriptures. And just like in English, like, well, how do you have a scripture that's non-canonical? How is it really scripture? But it's not as ridiculous as you think, because you I'm sure you've had debates with Roman Catholics, right? And you'll say, well, St. Jerome said there's a 66 book, 66 book script, scripture. And then a Roman Catholic who hasn't read a lot of history go, well, how do you explain here where St. Jerome quotes the Judith as scripture or whatever? It's because St. Jerome would have understood that when he called it scripture, he didn't mean it in the same way. <laughs> Because that was very common. No one yeah. talks about that now, but that was very common then. It, like I said, it's right in St. Ath- Athanasius' letter. Like, he just takes it yeah. for granted. This is, of course, how we deal with it. Now, for Anglicans, we know this very well, and we'll get to this at the end, because in the Articles of Religion for Anglicans, only the 66 books are given the name of Scripture, it says. But then in the Book of Homilies, which is one of our formularies, it quotes the Deuterocanon canon throughout and calls it Scripture in a few places. And a lot of Anglicans who come from the sort of evangelical background, read that and think, what the heck is going on? They get very confused and they think, is this some sort of contradiction? The homilies are contradicting the articles of religion, which can't be the case because it's the same authors, more or less. Uh, it's because we have that that more open view. Uh, but we'll get to that a bit later. So just to, just to go back on track to our question, so are you saying in the Orthodox Church, the criteria for canonicity is essentially tradition, custom? Essentially tradition, the, what the tradition is discerning, like I alluded to, is whether books are laid up in the temple, which have gained the, the force of law through custom. And for the New Testament, quite quite simply, it's whether an apostle wrote it. So like that's a very simple criteria. Um, and I think there's some debate, well, is technically St. Clement an apostle? Because he was in a, you know, he was accomplice of St. Paul, and he's mentioned in a letter. It's kind of like St. Mark, right? Like, well, St. Mark was not necessarily apostle unless he was the naked young man in Mark chapter 14, which is an interesting theory. Um, but right, like, so unless, you know, but how? And the tradition just says, well, no, he just wrote what Peter told him, right? Mm-hmm. So they kind of like, even the apostolic standard is a, gives a little leeway as long as the person was very faithful to what an apostle told him. So hence we got Luke and Mark and I think Clement writing Hebrews, which is, he happens to be the most popular author that's floated as the author of Hebrews. That's not Paul. And I like that. Wow, okay, that. that raises a question. Um, so if 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 Hebrews is apostolic because it was written by Clement, would that mean that first Clement should be considered scripture? As one of the canons, approved canon lists in the Orthodox Church does list first Clement as scripture. Which one is that? That is the canon of the, yeah, and the apostolic, apostolic canons does, canons. yeah, 85, yeah. yeah. So would you would you say there's there's a chance that scripture? I'd say yes. Though I would I would take serious the traditional scripture of St. Paul that he had something to do with it. And so, right, we're saying with the book of first and and I think second Clement is authentically ascribed. And I understand you said and think so and, and et cetera. I think there's actual solid textual reasons that it's authentically ascribed. It doesn't really change anything for what it's worth, but interesting question. That what it comes down to it is that could be the the qualitative difference between Hebrews, even though you know Hebrews is some people that had doubt of that in church history, but the difference between Hebrews and maybe first Clement is that plausibly maybe um, St. Paul had something to do with uh, with Hebrews. 
un- unlike first Clement. I personally think that Clement was just the like the scribe for it, but a scribe given you know considerable leeway in in formulating it, and which is why the whole scriptural approach and just the tone of Hebrews is so similar to first Clement. Mm, okay, I think that's a good point. I, I think I don't think that Paul wrote Hebrews, but when you read Hebrews, it is quite clearly Pauline in the sense that whoever wrote this is clearly close of Paul, and they and they're both friends of Timothy, so they're in the same circles. Uh, so yeah. and there's so just it, Pauline it's analogy. historically plausible, and yeah, like they use the classic Pauline metaphor of running the race and that sort of thing. It sort of seems that way. Okay, interesting. But so, uh, so are you saying there is a chance that First Clement is scripture? Well, it's it's definite that it's it's canonical according to at least one measure. So yeah, yeah. but I would, yeah. but see, my my approach would be the way we'd approach scripture is well, if it's in just this one canon or two, and it's in the Damascene, but it's in less, but Hebrews is in more, you start perceiving well, what is the Holy Spirit telling us in this that it doesn't have the same sort of consensus, and it may be because of this the qualitative difference of. Clement's role in one versus the other. So that that's how I would view it. Okay. So I think that leads us nicely into the next thing, which I think we might spend a bit of time on, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, but from hearing what you're saying, it sounds like you're saying there might be a difference between the books of the Bible, between some being more inspired than others. Sort of. It's okay. you wouldn't put it that way, but I would see why people would put it that way. Sure. So I think as it comes to, for instance, the, the Deutero canon, where when it comes to books like Maccabees, there's nowhere near as much universal consensus about their canonicity as there are for the Pentateuch. The way I see it, and if you think there's a fourth option, let me know. There's really three options for how to deal with that. Option one, as you could say, the Deuter canon is just as inspired as the Hebrew canon. It's just as much scripture. It should be in your Bible. No questions asked. I feel like that's the pop Eastern Orthodox view. You know, a lot of YouTube apologists will have that view. And, I, and I've heard Michael Lofton say that pretty much at verbatim. So, yeah, that's also yeah. like the big Roman. That's where it comes from. It's Roman Catholic apologetics. Yeah. Trent yeah. doesn't say that, by the way. I, I'm, I'm I sure most really... of them thought it, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. I. I know I don't have much interest in the Roman Catholic view of candidacy. It just seems a bit silly to me and, and like a lot of Roman Catholic stuff is, of course. And oh, what's we can exciting be silly about, too, don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> but what's exciting about talking to an Eastern Orthodox Christian about this is I actually think that a sensible Protestant view is much more similar to an Eastern Orthodox view that people uh, on both sides are probably willing to admit. But moving on, so so that's the that's the pop view. The another view is they could be less inspired, which we might unpack a bit more. And then the third view, which is my view, and this is what I've argued is the Anglican Church's view, is that something's either inspired or not. So that it can't something can't be more inspired than something else. But with the Deuterocanon, Canon, there is a possibility that they're not inspired, and there's a possibility that they are, and we can't have any certainty about it. So we approach the Deuterocanon Canon with an open and respectful skepticism. So we're going, this could be scripture, but it could not be scripture. And so we just have that kind of, we're juggling there a bit. And a lot of Protestants today just, I feel like they can't accept or even cope with that attitude that seems so bizarre to them. They, they want the certainty of this either is or isn't. And I think we should be a bit more relaxed about it and not have this sort of Cartesian view that either is certain or it's not and just chill a bit. But anyway, <laughs> out of those sort of, and unless you think there's a fourth option, out of those three, where do you end up sort of siding with? The I most? mean, the two is obviously the closest, but in reality, it's more the there's qualitative differences in the kind of inspiration. That's that is the answer that uh, I want to I want to give. If I have some time to unpack that. Sure, pl- please go ahead. That's, that's so, that sounds very interesting. To to really like unpack this, uh, it's this is not in my authority. It's not my crazy idea. Now. St. Nicodemus a Hegirite, even though he's on Mount Athos, people, it's not like Sorry, he was... Can you just explain a little bit about who uh, who the saint is? All right, so St. Nicodemus a Hegirite and it was a, a monastic. He was college-educated. Um, he was published. He wrote books. He read a ton of books. He was a polyglot. He knew several languages. And 
he was essentially a scholar, right? What like what century was this? This was is in around? the 18th and 19th centuries. Yeah. So he's a pretty much a Greek scholar, and and so people they say scholar, and they don't think someone's a real monastic because we have those two. We have people that are monks, but like just on paper. They, we have people even that are bishops, but just on paper. They're really just academics. But Saint Nicodemus was a literal scholar first time, a literal academic, and also a literal spiritual man, like a real a literal holy man. He was actually both, and and. This is not rare in the Orthodox tradition. St. Mark Ephesus would have been one of these and, and so on and so forth going into the past. Um, and so he's this academic. And the reason he's important is because he was so well read and he published so many books. Right. So he's pretty much like a saint. Mostly he's remembered fondly because he published books. Right. Like he's this. It's sort of like. You know, uh, there's Protestant missionaries that translated the Bible into 30 different Indian languages, right? Like, so you don't call them saints, maybe, but you go, this guy's special, right? You remember him as special. Well, this is why St. Nicodemus is a saint. This is what makes him special, particularly. And so the uh, Philokalia and uh, the Rudder are really the two most important books. He did a lot more than that, though. But those are literally, those are the two most important books he wrote. One's for canon law, which is what we're talking about, the Rudder. And the other books were spiritual writings, in a sense, because a saint distilled through all these spiritual writings and put them in a, in a volume of books, that he could even take books that weren't written by saints, so weren't written by people condemned from the church, like Evagrius. The guy's condemned. He's in hell, technically. But I know this sounds nuts. <laughs> I'm just telling you what it is. You know, I'm not saying you don't, you don't have to find it nuts. But that, but because those works from Evagrius are in the Philokalia, that means that you could take it to the bank that's like a saint set it. Which for the Orthodox, it's like it, you could take it like it's in the Bible. It's they're pretty much functionally equivalent. They're not qualitatively equivalent, but they're essentially functionally equivalent. How we deal with sacred tradition that this puts a heretic's writings into sacred tradition, but they're always treated this way. His the saints have always said with Evagrius that you have to avoid his theological speculations, but his spiritual teachings are very wholesome and, and good and beneficial. And that actually makes a lot of sense because in reality, there's people that are horrible stuff, but great with other things. And, you know, you got to eat the meat and spit out the bones. That's just reality. And, and that's what St. Nicodemus did. And so with the rudder, the rudder is the collection of the what's called the Fodian Noma, Noma Canon, which in plain English is the consensus list of canon law of the orthodox all right that's that's our uh, authoritative canon law and his job is to interpret the canon law this this so gets like a into collection of all the canon law documents so it's sort of like is it like the um denzinger of the of the eastern orthodox church? i don't know who denzinger is i know uh, he's a roman catholic guy that's quoted and stuff uh, but... denzinger is like a it's a massive multi-volume book that collects every single like magisterial source, Catholic canon law, yeah. So ecumenical councils, ex cathedra statements, it's all in Denzinger. Yeah, with um, with the rudder, it's it's more strictly just the canons, not into like conciliar decrees and stuff. It's just canons. Right. And I'll say the super fast. What's easier to make new canons for new situations, or to let a bunch of jurists? reinterpret old canons and then adjust in the new situations, right? So in the second millennium of Orthodox history, they went that uh, uh, juris, jur, juridical route with canons mostly. They, it's not like no other canons exist, but they mostly went that juridical route, which made the work of canonists more important. Like there, you can't list a canonist per se in the first millennium, but there's several popular canonists in the second millennium because the work the canonists became more important because they weren't making as many new canons and they didn't get um, pan-Orthodox consensus. And the Roman Catholics had a lot of this as well, by the way. But but so that being said, with the rudder, that's its importance, right? And so now you have uh, this can this interpreter of the canon, he is a saint for us, so the interpretations carry authority now, right? Those those interpretations are like canons themselves because they come from a saint. And so his job is to look at all these varying different canons, and he is an academic. He's like, yep, these things don't correspond with one another. He saw what every pop orthodox apologist does not see because <laughs> he's actually an academic, right? Like, unlike all these pop orthodox apologists, you know, he's actually an academic. He saw the obvious. 
Now, I think the so people have to hear it from me. If you want to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, read the footnote footnote to Apostolic Canon eighty five. And what follows is a, a very thorough discussion of what we're about to talk about. But is there a I way just, that people can access that online for free? Yeah, the rudder is free. I don't think it's even on Scribd. It, it's it's a terrible translation, by the way, but it's the only one we have in English. Um, and you just Google the rudder PDF and you can find it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. And uh, so anyhow, it's uh, St. Nicodemus writes in the footnote that it was gleaned from the unpublished theological treatise, the teacher, Mr. Eugenius. All right. Which is interesting because what, uh, what I'm about to read to you is actually not written by St. Nicodemus. It's He was an academic, right? So another academic wrote something. He agreed with it. So he quoted it. And that's what we have. And that's what we have. So it's like it's kind of like a vagarious. Right. You could quote a non saint, but because the saint quoted it, found it authoritative, it grants it authority um, uh, in sacred tradition. Now, just so people are aware that St. Nicodemus elsewhere, like in his comments to uh, this is the Greek numbering to Carthaginian Canon 32, he makes specific reference to this footnote. So it shows like he expects you to read this like it's important. Right. Like read this footnote or you're not going to understand Canon. And uh, so I could stop there if you have any weird side questions, because then I I no, gotta no, I go into going. the weeds with this. Yeah, let's let's keep going for a bit. All right, so we're gonna get into these weeds now, right? And so this footnote says that Saint Nicodemus is quoting from Mr. Eugenios that the canons obviously don't align, right? The canon, as in the canons, in terms of. Canon in law, the, or are we talking the canon of scripture? Oh, the canon of scripture. The the canon law, the, the varying different canons of the councils and of the saints, because there's there's saints that have their own canons, mm-hmm. don't match each other. So the biblical canon they all give doesn't match. Like we yeah, all have been yeah. alluding to this whole episode, right? And I'm just gonna quote the the footnote says, um, because I think this this gets to it very in one sense. It says, so it may be said that the sequence and order of books now read by all and printed and published as um oh I forget I can't read the next word. As the text of the Bible is by no means correct <laughs> and certain as respects to the books, the old testament for many reasons. So look how frankly he puts it. It's by no means correct or certain. That's not me talking, that's that's in the runner. And you're never going to hear people talk. That's why I'm, I, I laugh. It's not that it's actually haha funny, but it's like, why does no one talk about this? It's it put kind of plainly. It's nobody needs correct or certain. Why? Can you explain it just a little bit for, because I, I imagine most people watching this don't know much about any of this. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. for the rudder for, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, how authoritative is this? Is this talk? Oh, uh, there's not a bishop on the planet that doesn't use the rudder. It's absolutely essential for the job. The take the rudder to the bank. That's a, the the rudder's treated as an authoritative source. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe perhaps Denzinger's. I know less about it, but it's take it to the bank. It's pretty much you know a step below the scriptures and the ecumenical councils, and we want to treat it as if it's negotiable or anything. But it's it's very important. Okay, cool. Thank you. So yeah, let's let's keep going then. So that's quite interesting. So this very authoritative text says, what was that quote again? About the it says that the uh, that the text of the Bible is by no means correct and certain as respect the books of the Old Testament for many reasons. Right. And so he's he's just specifying the Old Testament there. He's not not the New Testament. Yes, it's. Well, the, the reason why, if you will, we'll get into some of these weeds, is not because he doesn't apply the same logic to the New Testament. He does. It's rather because there's more textual differences in the Old Testament. There's the Vulgate. There's the Masoretic text. There's the Syriac. The, you know, um, and he makes reference to all these things, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why you know the footnote says that it that the text of the Bible is by no means correct, right? Right? Because like. We might not exactly know what the like you know epistemic in an epistemic certainty sort of way what the exact word is you know um, in let's say in Deuteronomy or Psalms eight that they vary they differ they differ between one tradition and the other you know right it's not at all certain 
Now, obviously, I as a redactor don't find that as a very big deal, but it, this is something that's recognized, is my point. We don't, we don't pretend this doesn't exist. But what, what are these many reasons? Now, I sum them up for you, so I'm not going to quote, but reasons one through three and five, which he gives, are the canons that the, the councils have, have contradictions with additions and omissions, right? So if the canons of the councils contradict, well, then how could we be certain, right? So pretty, pretty obvious. Now, um, reason number four is that the canons dispute whether a book is canonical or apocryphal. He actually uses the word apocryphal. He explains, though, that the name apocrypha was invented by the heretics. So he doesn't actually like the word. He seems to be using it as some sort of condescension to common usage. So what they're talking about is readable. So like, and they cite the, the three books of Maccabees as an example of this. And so the we there's dispute whether it's canonical or if it's simply a readable book, right? Like we were alluding to before. So this is not me coming up with, with just opinions. Like we, again, we read this in St. Athanasius. Now we're reading this and something quoted by St. Nicodemus is authoritative, right? So th this is a common criteria in which the Orthodox discern scripture. And here's a, a lovely one, because it's very modern. Printed Bibles in his time had differed in the number of books. So he was just like, you, you know, you as a Protestant might look at your shelf and go, yep, 66, 66, 66 with Apocrypha, right? And that's what you have, right? Mm -hmm. So he went and did the same thing, and he went, 66, 74, 75, 68, yeah, I mean, in my right. shop, <laughs> he did the same thing. I've, and got an, I've got an Orthodox <laughs> Bible which has the most, and then I've got I've got Catholic Bibles of was it seventy two or seventy three? Seventy three. Then I got these sixty six Protestant ones. Yeah, there's all kinds of differences. Yeah, and so by like the whole idea, you look at your bookshelf and you go, look, they're different. That's not very crazy. That's literally one of mm -hmm. the reasons he gives. <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty reasonable. And so from the preceding, it's concluded. Um, that he, the quote, the footnote, it seems to be best to call the uncanonical books, the old Testament readable books, right? So not, again, not my opinion. This is calls them uncanonical and calls them readable, right? That that's, we call the uncanonical books readable and not apocrypha. The books properly and especially called readable are the following. Now he gives a list. Nehemiah, Nehemiah the laudation of the three servants, instead of which is called the, uh, uh, which is, we call the song, the three holy children. Yeah. Bell and the Dragon. So, right, like you see a Roman Catholic say, you have the wrong book of Daniel, right? You ever hear that in, a, in polemics? Mm -hmm. You have the wrong book of Daniel. And like here's like, oh, it's readable book of Daniel, <laughs> right? The real book of Daniel doesn't have this. So, right. and Susanna, um, he says, for these books are even mentioned, are, are, I think it's, are not even mentioned in the present apostolic canon or by Council Laodicea or that of Carthage or Athanasius the Great or by Divine Gregory or by Amphilochius. Um, and he says, Origen, though, did have a homily on Nehemiah. Right? So they'll look at, well, if they once, you know, if they made a homily even about Nehemiah, Nehemiah this is something where we got to give, give some credit to this book. And th this is interesting because it also shows, like, I don't even think Nehemiah is on the chopping block of Protestant Bibles, right? It's It shows a very different um, view from the Orthodox. Mm. But again, we view it as readable. So again, it's like, just because it's readable doesn't mean you don't read it, right? It, it actually means you do read it. Yes. So it, it's not a problem for us, right? We read the, li I read the lives of saints every morning, right? Mm. And I, I read the scriptures and I read the lives of saints. And so like, I go, oh, well, one's not actually scripture. I'm not gonna read it. It's not how we approach stuff. That's not how we approach things devotionally. No, and that's not how Protestants should either. Um, it's, and we're obviously, Anglicans read the Deuterocanon the Deuterocanonical books in uh, liturgy anyway, but we also read Reformers. And if, if for Anglicans, we should be reading the homilies as well, um, even in a liturgical sense. So, yeah. Now, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, um, but I could get into the qualitative differences between readable books and the canonical books. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's Let's get into that. And so, quoting the footnote, it states that divine scripture is the word of God as written under his inspiration. I want to emphasize that. That's what makes canonical scripture. It's written under inspiration. 
It has also been added under his inspiration by way of differentiating it from ecclesiastical canons and decrees. I'm going to just repeat that. It's different than ecclesiastical canons and decrees. Those are not written under God's direct inspiration. So how are they written? To quote the footnote, ecclesiastical canons and decrees are written under the superintendence of God, but not under his inspiration. Right? So an ecumenical council is not like the Bible, per se, right? The Bible is prophetic, thus saith the Lord. The councils aren't. The councils are what men have put together. Now, that again, we're, they're saints, and so we don't think what they put together is optional. But they are qualitatively different, right? And so it's interesting, he compares readable scripture and divine scripture with the councils, right? Readable is not prophetic, like the scriptures. Now, let's continue. Wherefore, they are not even called God-inspired. Those are the councils, right? They are not even called God-inspired, as is plainly expressed in various parts of the conciliar records. Thus, in point of fact, the Holy Spirit actually dictated the words themselves in the case of the Holy Scriptures, right? Again, the Holy Spirit dictates the Scriptures. That's a specific quality of the Scriptures. But in the case of the councils and synods, I'm quoting the footnote, it was only the thought that was expressed under the superintendence and illumination of the Holy Spirit. Meaning, right, it's like your, we call it inspiration, right? Like, God gave me this idea. God put this on my mind. But we don't think that's Scripture, right? So that's what, the count, it, that's what the council is. Yeah, I think Protestants have that would need not as not as we don't take it as far as Eastern Eastern Orthodox do, but we do would have to have some sort of view that the Reformation, for instance, was in some sense superintended by God. Uh, of course, we sort of have to think that. And that's, so, yeah, like, so let's say if if Protestants have a soft view of superintendence, the Orthodox have a hard view. So like yeah. in Acts chapter fifteen, right? It kind of specifies that they're debating this topic. And after they're done with the debate, it says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the importance that Orthodox draw from that is that when, even if we're all arguing, right? Like we're having a debate, we then we forge a solution. We all have a consensus. Well, that is a synergy with the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So the soup that shows that the Holy Spirit superintended the debates in the council or, or whatever, and then the solution is what God superintended what he wanted. But he didn't write the solution. He enabled you to arrive at the solution he wanted yeah. you to arrive at. Right. So it's it's not very magical or mystical in that sense, but it is very spiritual, capital S, right? So the reason I bring this up is because like when I bring up that this is what Orthodox believe about councils, because people doubt what even like Father Richard Price and like anyone that's read these ancient sources just knows this is how they treated them. They go, you're crazy. How do you say this? You know, like, but the scripture, the councils disagree. You know, people disagree during the councils. What What's God inspiring if they disagree with each other? And I go, this is a silly argument. The scriptures quote Satan. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like Satan talk, he talks in the script. It's not like you can't have even a prophetic source where someone evil's quoted. But again, like if you understand what we believe about councils, it's just that, yeah, the debates are permitted by God and take the direction that they do so that the right conclusions arrived at. So that's why, like, even when someone points out, well, Council and I see too said some silly things, or they believe some silly things, or they quoted some. So, you know, pseudo apollinarian forgeries in Constantinople 3 or, or, or whatever, it's our view of inspiration for the council doesn't demand that they're they're right in like how they arrived to their conclusion, right? Just like there were far there were those who came from the Pharisees in Acts chapter 15, right? They were wrong. What what we believe is correct is the solution that they arrive at and how sure. they arrive at that solution. Of course, we disagree about that. <laughs> I, I know you disagree, well <laughs> but I'm just, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to explain the logic. Yeah. But if you, it's your show. Yeah. If you yeah. want to go disagree with it, it takes no, some no, time it's to good. disagree. So, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially, are you, are you gearing up to say that the Deuter canon is superintended but not inspired? Yes. That, that, is, right. that, is, the, that is the answer that Nicodemus gives in the footnote. And you're and, saying that should be the essentially official view of the Eastern Orthodox Church. It should be because this is 
falls in line with the tradition over centuries from the beginning of readable and canonical books. What wow. makes one readable versus the other canonical? I think I can speak for myself and probably the vast majority of people watching this. That's not, I, we've never heard any East Orthodox apologists on YouTube say anything like that before. Um, because, because most, a lot of people deal with theology because it's about winning arguments or about mm. convincing people. It's like a sophistry, right? If it's just about convincing someone, you're almost, you're doing it because you want this convincing rhetoric, you know, truth be darned, right? But it's, but that's not our actual theological heritage, right? Like I'm trying right. to tell you what our actual theological heritage is. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I think this is a far more uh, sensible view anyway. So, so, so the, so the books of Maccabees are not God breathed like the Pentateuch is. You can't say thus saith the Lord quoting Maccabees, but you could say that God had a hand in its composition and editing process and that god has superintended tradition in such a way that this book has been read down through the centuries for a reason he, that wasn't some sort of mistake obviously well it's uh, essentially that's correct i'm going to quote again the footnote because it addresses that issue specifically um it says that you know dynasties alexandrian and saint jerome it said that the they say that the mysterious and principal passages in the Bible were indeed written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but that the historical parts were written with his superintendence and in the style of peculiar to the authors themselves. Inferring from the difference in phraseology in the Decalogue, which Moses uses in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, let me just translate for you. Like when it says thou, you know, thou shalt not, or thus saith the Lord, that's a pretty good indication this is not historical, this is prophetic, right? Mm, mm. And secondly, just quoting the footnote, from the fact that the author of the second book of Maccabees says that he finished the book with much labor and sweat. And in the same book, the same author says, if I've done well and have finally composed this, that is what I've myself desired to do. But if imperfectly and in a mediocre fashion, that is the best I could attain to. For they ask, how could the author of that book have said these things if... Everything has been dictated to him word for word, even jot to a jot by the Holy Spirit. Right? So you think that's an argument from a Protestant, but this is literally what they say. Like clearly this isn't prophetic, because yeah. how else would he say this? Mm -hmm. So you're not you're not crazy if you've ever said that before. The the rudder says the same exact thing. Wow. I I <laughs> this is a very compelling uh argument you're making for this for this view. Uh it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, well, because I didn't come up with it. That's why it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there anything more that you'd like to add about about these these footnotes? Yeah. So, like, guess. Guess what are the biblical proof texts that, the, that Nicodemus quotes in the footnote for the difference between what is really scripture and what's not? He quotes 1 Timothy 3.16, right? Oh. Just like, you know, like the Protestant proof text, right? He quotes 1 yeah, Timothy yeah. 3.16 because like, duh, right? That That's what scripture is. And uh, 1 Peter uh, 1, 20 to 21. Um, no, it's 2 Peter. No scriptures okay. by uh, private um, interpretation, but from what, well, you know, the men of God have been directed to say by the Holy Spirit, something like that, right? So like his biblical proof text is like, of course, the scriptures are what the Holy Spirit himself penned. And we have books we call scriptures that are not that, and they are readable books. And so that's essentially the orthodox answer. Hmm. And so that's why, like, when St. Philaret of Moscow or St. Nikolai Azika or St. Jerome use a 66-book canon, they're not being silly, right? What they're, what they're pretty much saying is this is the popular number of books that everyone considers universally prophetic. That's where they, that's where they get it from. So it's not a that that's why I think if people had a higher view of our saints, I'm, I'm this is more a critique of my own people, by the way. If we Orthodox had a higher view of our saints, we would not be scandalized hearing this stuff from my mouth because we'd accept. Well, if Saint Philaret said sixty six book canon, there's got to be something to it, right? What 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 is that something? Well, maybe you don't know, but now you can't say that because now you've read it in the rudder. What that something is? Right. Yeah. Is there a chance, though, that these books, some of these books are scripture, are inspired? The chance would be 
I would say with the books, which there's not a consensus that they're just merely readable, right? So like if St. Athanasius, right, he, he literally says readable, not readable. Well, if he treats it as, you know, uh, as canonical instead of readable, then yes, then you'd be in your right saying, I think this is prophetic. Um, another example of this is Nehemiah, which obviously finds itself into some 66 book canons from the saints. So even though in, in the in the rudder, it's used as this example of a perhaps a readable book, um, I, I would say you could legitimately argue, well, no, I think it is prophetic because we have saints that treat it as such. And so there would be, it's, I don't think as much of a fuzzy fringe that maybe you would have with the, the doubt, but what we, what we don't have whatsoever is that the books are meaningless or maybe mean is not how you'd put it, but that they weren't superintended by the Holy Spirit, right? If it's superintended by God, then by default makes it important. Yeah. So why these books and why can't other books be similarly superintended? You mean like uh, just the ones in the Orthodox canons? Yeah, so I, just to give an example, I, I would say pretty much every Orthodox Christian, not not Eastern Orthodox, but just non-heretical Christian, would look to something like Against Heresies by Irenaeus or First Clement, even or um, as not scripture, or, or on the Incarnation by Athanasius. It's not scripture, but we all look to it as being authoritative. Could, why can't we say that's superintended like the Deuterocanon is, and therefore readable in church? Well, what we actually sort of already established is you kind of could argue that, right? Like there, mm-hmm. the Proto-Evangelicum James, the Life of the Virgin from John Geometries, these were read liturgically in church. So mm-hmm. you could kind of make that argument. You could also find stuff like from St. Maximus and also by other sources where they treat the saints. They literally set they treat them to quote uh, Father Maximus Contus, who's a probably one of, the, one of the greatest Orthodox translators and scholars of our time, um, you know, that they treat them akin to Scripture for that reason, because they they even say they're they're graced by the same Holy Spirit, they grace St. Paul and stuff like that. So it's some of this is somewhat honorifics, right? Because they're not saying that they were prophetic in precisely the same way, but they are saying they're superintended. We also have in the councils where they speak of the canonical books of Augustine and of you know, St. Ambrose and St. Athanasius and, and et cetera. So what are these canonical books? Well, it's actually kind of bestowing a authority of superintendence to what they wrote. Um, so you might not read a fine theological treatise by St. Athanasius in the liturgy, but is it superintended? Well, we actually have ecumenical councils say yes. So mm-hmm. it's not as ridiculous as you'd say. It'd just be more like kind of bizarre. Because usually the liturgical texts are like histories of the saints of biblical times or written by the saints of biblical times, right? Yeah. Um, so like that's why it makes sense to have stuff about Mary, right? Because Mary is in the Bible, right? So like that's why you might read something about Mary liturgically but not something about um, Thecla, let's say, who came mm-hmm. afterwards. You know, though uh, I wouldn't be totally surprised if in some quarters even that uh, St. Paul and Thecla was read liturgically because St. Paul was in it. And people aren't aware that book is from the first century. So if it's so early and people might really thought this is an authentic tradition about St. Paul, you, it might find its way into liturgical reading as well. Right. Wow. Okay. So I think that that result, that answers essentially the, the question about the Deuter canon. So it's not, it's not inspired or God breathed, but it is superintended and therefore has spiritual authority behind it and it's readable in the liturgy let's just go back a, a little bit just before we move on to your thoughts on the, the anglican perspective on the non deuterocanonical books so the the sort of 66 book canon are we are, are you also saying that there is still some openness about some of those books maybe not being included or or not because the, uh, my, as we my, said, these canon lists and these ecumenical councils actually don't include some of those books, even in the 66 canon. For instance, Revelation, again, uh, out of the four canon lists, only two of them include Revelation. 
which actually right. isn't read in the Eastern Orthodox liturgy either. Same yep. as in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, Revelation is never read. So is there is there some epistemic uncertainty about that book, or would you say that? I don't think about it? Revelation because when the saints explain why it might not be in the canon, the reason they give is not because St. John didn't write it, but because people misunderstand it, right? So that kind of explains why it's missing. So we take the saints at the word why that's the reason it's missing, and so that would give me moral certainty that it is canon. But like for something like Esther, um, technically – Technically, like, you know, I don't have doubt personally, but you can say, well, you know, I'm a stickler to the canon, you know, the the council of whatever. I forget which one leaves out Esther. But right, I'm a stickler of this one, so I, I don't want to print it in my Orthodox Bible. Right? right? Let's say you're the Antiochian jurisdiction, you're making a you're because uh you have to get blessings from bishops and synods to print Bibles and stuff in the Orthodox Church. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, they may be like, well, we don't bless to have Esther in it. And that you wouldn't that's technically not bizarre. I don't. I don't see that happening in the 21st century, you know. But it it wouldn't be historically bizarre. I mean, that's exactly what the footnote we just read was talking about. He lo- right. He looks at his bookshelf, and not all the Bibles are the same. Sure. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So someone could a an individual East North Fox Christian, or maybe maybe a diocese could have. Oh, do you do you call them dioceses in the East North Fox Church? Yeah, we we have dioceses and whatnot. Yeah, and synods and. You could, you could side of just one canon, could you? You could say, I believe in the canon of the apostolic canons, or the synod, or the synod of Laodicea. Yeah, you could do that. Okay, because like, because right. that's that's essentially what the Russian Holy Synod did, right? Like they they stuck with Saint Philaret's canon, right? You know, he's he's Metropolitan of Moscow. He's a saint, and like, you know, that's his canon. You know, mm. so it's um. There's, there's, yeah, there's something strange about that, you know, and, and that's like what people don't get. Like, for example, we're, you know, we're still in the midst of the great icon war of 2023, right? Well, I don't know when you're going to publish this video, but for what it's worth in this great icon war, sometimes people talk about icons of the father and what the Orthodox tradition is around that. And I can just simply say is I'm Russian Orthodox. We have a canon against it. Now, if you're Greek Orthodox, you don't. If you're Antiochian Orthodox, you don't, right? And there's not a lot of examples of this, by the way. It's so like apologists that don't understand Orthodoxy could be like, oh, look at all this uncertainty. Like, there's really not a lot of this. But for this one issue, I can say, listen, we got a canon on this. I don't have to worry about what the other traditions are. I'm being faithful to what my church teaches, right? Yep. And my church is the Russian church. And so that's that's something you could do. Okay. Well, that's been very helpful. Thank you. So let's... Just to finish up, let's. I'd love to pick your brain a bit about how you would interact with these, with what the Anglican formularies say about the canon. So I've put it in the uh, private chat. I'm just all right. Let me click. That's pretty. All right, here we go. Hold on. I'll get the other bit. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure how much you know about Anglicanism. Actually, just a quick question: what, What's your background? Were you have you always been Eastern Orthodox? Did you start off something else and convert? Or? No, I was I was brought up with nothing. Okay. <laughs> I was baptized yeah. Lutheran, though. Um, just so I'd be baptized, I was never really brought to church. And then when I returned to church. Um, there's a whole thing, but long story short, I went to my wife's church, which was reformed. And our only Reformed church in town was Baptist. And from there, we converted to Orthodoxy. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Anyway, so in the Anglican church, we have the formularies, which are our authoritative texts that determine our liturgy and our doctrine and so on and so forth. The most authoritative is what we call the Articles of Religion. This is essentially our confession of faith. And Article 6 is about the canon of Scripture. And it says... In the name of Holy Scripture, we do understand those canonical books of the Old Testament and New Testament of whose authority was never in any doubt in the church. So the important thing there is that this is the only criteria for canonicity we ever find in the Anglican formularies, and it's that it's the books that were never in any doubt. Of course, that's actually not quite true because some of those 66 books have been in doubt by a few outliers. And in living memory of the people who wrote these 
articles because Luther and Zwingli had some concerns about some books. But in any case, that's essentially the criteria for candidacy the Orthodox Church has, isn't it? Those books which were never in any doubt. Essentially, as long as we're not excluding readable books, but yeah. Oh, but, but we'll get to the readable in just a second. So as, as, in terms of the 66 books, it's, it looks like it's the same criteria. And then it says, of the name and number of these canonical books, it then lists the 39 books of the Hebrew canon, and then later on we'll do the New Testament canon. And it says we receive them as they're com- commonly received. So they're not going with Calvin who would say who would say the criteria for canonicity is the sort of self-authenticating witness or that sort of thing. I think that's what the Westminster Confession says. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. But I, th- I think from memory the Westminster Confession says these books are sort of self authenticate as scripture or something, but that's not what the articles of religion are doing. Then it gets to the Deuterocanon. And the other books capitalizes B on books, so they're not just any old book. As Jerome saith, the church doth read, for example, of life and instruction of manners. So again, in the in the Orthodox Church, you say this, they're especially uh, for catechumens. Same here. But yet doth it not apply them to establish any doctrine. And then lists uh, third and fourth Esdras, Tobit, Judith, Esther editions, Daniel editions, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, first and second Maccabees, and Prayer of Manasseh. So I feel like after everything we've said in this episode, it's more or less the Eastern Orthodox perspective, isn't it? We've got it's the 66 close. books as they're commonly received, the Deuter canon, we, we read them in the lectionary, so we read all, most of those in their entirety, whereas for instance, Revelation in the Book of Common Prayer's lectionary isn't listed to be read in the liturgy, but all of Sirach is throughout the year. So uh, we're definitely putting them on a pretty big pedestal. I feel like, what, what are the differences here, do you think? Um, well, it depends who you ask. All right, let me argue, Let me read something for you where they agree with you almost 100%. Are you ready? Don't mm-hmm. fall off your chair. This is from the book, These Truths We Hold. It's written by a monk of St. Tikhon's, which whenever they write something like that anonymously, it probably is an OCA bishop. But So so anyway, this is a a book out of St. Tikhon's Press. Um, It states that um, it talks about the Deuterocanon. All right. And it says it's contrasted with proto-canonical books. All right. But let me, here's the, the money quote. All of the Orthodox Church accepts these books, the Deuterocanon, as being canonical and treasures them and uses them liturgically. She does not use them as primary sources in the definition of her dogmas. Right. Right. And so, like, we go, oh, you know, someone's going to say, what kind of crazy things River saying to these Anglicans, this crazy stuff? It's like, well, I could quote an Orthodox book saying <laughs> almost the same thing. Just be aware. Now, The reason why I'd be careful of that is probably the crucial difference is the word primary, while yours says, doth not apply them, which... Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me actually clarify that. In the Book of Homilies, which is the main, it's it's our largest formulary. It's a fat tome of homilies for various things. So we've got the homily on uh, Good Friday, the Passion of Jesus. So what is the Passion about? Got a homily about it. Throughout the homilies, the Deuterocanon is quoted extensively, uh, use to establish doctrine. And funnily enough, in the whole Nicaea 2 debate, our largest homily is against Nicaea 2. It's called On the Perilous Idolatry. Uh, no, On the Peril of Idolatry. And it's all about the Federation of Images. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. It, um, As you can probably expect, it quotes from Wisdom of is it Wisdom of Solomon? We've got that. Yes, so, yeah, I think it's chapter 11 that gets it. Has, as you can imagine, it has a field day of that passage and and clearly uses it to establish doctrine. I think I've got so, a real ex- good exegesis of that passage, though. It's, okay. But yeah, I know the passage. Yeah. So it does it does use it to establish doctrine. I think what's going on here is it, what it really means is it doesn't use them on their own to establish doctrine. So if something is contained in the Deuter Canon, that's not anywhere else. So, for instance, in Second Maccabees, where it says prayers for the dead are good, is a good idea, we wouldn't use that to establish doctrine. But if the Deuterocanon Canon is in agreement with the others, then they would. Seems yeah. To so, uh, hence the word primary, right? Yeah. So, like, it would be used like as the secondary source. So here's so in that in the way you cast it, then I'd say yeah, you know, essentially we agree. Mm-hmm. Um, 
what people don't understand about orthodoxy is we actually have a dogmatic statement in the Fifth Ecumenical Council of what is our religious authority. Now, this is not this shouldn't really surprise people. It's the scriptures. It's the scriptures. It's not that they're not the scriptures and tradition aren't necessarily put side by side. It's to how the scriptures have always been understood. And so how that works its way out is that the the scriptures are materially sufficient. Every doctrine that Orthodox Christians are supposed to believe is in the scriptures, right? And so if that's the case, applying what we're talking about right here, it would be within the canonical books and the readable books could contain those same doctrines, right? But they would not be the only place you'd find them. You'd also find them within the canonical scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so maybe just so like Protestants are aware, because I don't want to like kind of give them like a, a sugar coated poison pill from their view. It's like, <laughs> Yes, we, we believe the scriptures are materially sufficient. You don't need anything other than the scriptures approved doctrine. We do believe that we need tradition to understand those scriptures. And that's so you so and, you affirm well, the quality of sufficiency, which is a big part of Protestantism, but not the equality of perspicuity of scripture. Yes. And it's not because scriptures I, I don't want to make them out like they're rocket launches, right? Like they are pretty easy to understand if most of the things they're getting at. But there are things that are in types and in allegories, which are not totally simple. It's just just a fact. There's even mm -hmm. stuff that just due to our sin, we commonly have difficulty with. Like St. Peter talks about the stuff people get wrong in the works of St. Paul. And yeah, even, we don't say it's all perspicuous. We say we say what's necessary for salvation and to live a godly life is perspicuous, but not. Not but yeah, idea. but but yeah, but obviously, like, I guess my point is like in the Orthodox tradition, whether it's Saint Irenaeus, Saint Vincent de Lorenz, there's always this view like we need to tether the scriptures to this common understanding, mm -hmm. right? And why is that important? Because the same way we know the canons of scripture, not in this epistemic certainty sort of way, but rather in this way where like you have a good sense of yep, yeah, that's what it is because it's what we all believe because we believe that consensus to be the superintendence of the Holy Spirit. So in that sense, almost the entire Christian like witness through all of history is almost like the readable book of the canon. It's this suit, it's the Holy Spirit working the whole thing. And that and that's why if people find bizarre that Orthodox Christians will quote their own hymns, like you never see a Protestant do this, but we'll quote our hymns like they're doctrinal authorities. We'll we'll, we'll quote our prayers like they're doctrinal authorities. Well, why Orthodox operate this way? Because we view our entire existence as this as this God guided thing, right? And so it's like you. Can't I don't think it's so different you, from what should be a confessional Protestant view. Because, in in if you look at my videos, I sometimes quote the Anglican formularies almost as though they're scripture. Uh, you know, so they do have authority, and we would say. I, I would find it very peculiar for a confessional Protestant to not say that God superintended the Reformation and the or even the or the particular the, confession. You'll get the Westminster yeah. Bros and the London Baptist Confession Bros, and they'll come mm. to blows, right? Sort of deal over this. Yeah. And so they, yeah, they'll treat the confessions themselves borderline on that authority, other than when they're debating Roman Catholics and Orthodox. But between each other, they they get like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I'm not saying it's I'm, I don't think that's a ridiculous way of thinking because that's literally the whole orthodox mindset. So, wow, okay, so I think that I think we that's a pretty cool thing to have come to that that essentially the Anglican this article on the Anglican canon of scripture is very much similar, if not the same, as the orthodox Eastern Orthodox perspective. I guess we might have some disagreements about if the article can be justified in a Protestant framework, you might say it doesn't make sense for for this. Or maybe it's not even popularly enough accepted amongst Anglicans, right? <laughs> um, but it's, but yeah, but, yeah. but speaking out of principle, you know, yeah, you know, and there's a lot of alignment there. And uh, I think it's just the main term apocrypha we take issue with simply because it, it could be misused and misapplied to where it makes these readable books like somehow secondary and not authoritative. And so this comes yeah. a lot up in discourse where like, oh, you know, 
In 2 Maccabees, they pray for the dead, and this, you know, Calvin brings this up. And so this shows a defect in the book, and obviously Orthodox wouldn't treat it that way. Um, not that I, for what for the record, I don't believe 2 Maccabees 12 is actually positively approving of the practice. I don't think that's the right proof text. But that is, I had a debate with William Albrecht on that, by the way, which I won, which shows you how bad he debated. But that, that, that aside, um, we wouldn't treat like, oh, this sort of suspect thing in third, you know, in Baruch chapter three, where it looks like they're praying for the dead of Israel and stuff. Like, we, well, we go, well, well, yeah, we, we accept that. Where it seems to me, keyword seems, I'm the outsider looking in and from my own experience of Protestantism, where it seems to me like in Protestantism, it's like, well, they can start saying, well, I got some doubt whether this is really infallible, so I don't need to accept this. But right, we wouldn't treat something superintended by God like that. So that that's, yeah, okay. I think that's, that's, why, that's why we have the hard view, right? You might have the soft view. We, have soft view, we got this very right. hard, rigid view of superintendence. Because our, our perspective is uh, God has superintended the canon, but because there's disagreements amongst various church fathers and reformers and whatnot, and because we can't presume the amount to which God superintended it, we can't have epistemic certainty that this canon is the canon, the actual inspired canon, but we can, you know, more or less be sure about it, I guess is what we're saying. Uh, yeah. And then with second Maccabees. Yeah. I mean, I would do, I, I would say because that there is that weird thing, I, I, that little prayers for the dead part, which I also don't think is a very good proof text because it's, it's in the old covenant anyway. So you could just say, a Protestant could just say, um, yeah, prayers for the dead worked at that time because Hades still existed and the dead went to Sheol, but then Christ like was the final sacrifice and brought the elect well, the, the put in into some heaven. What, so. I, I think to distill what the actual point of the author was, was that the practice was questionable to him, right? But in as much as Judas Maccabeus was looking forward to the resurrection, it was commendable. So why have that detail if you actually wholesale approved the practice? Think about that, right? right? Yeah, right? No, it's, exactly. it's not commendable because of what they did was right. It was commendable because at least it confessed the resurrection of the dead, mm -hmm. right? So it's um, there's more to it because uh, there's more to the book, but that'd be unpacking a whole debate. But it's yeah, it's like one of those things where I cringe where people quote it. It's it Saint Augustine does quote it in that sense, but I I just don't think that's the right way of interpreting that passage personally. Um, I would go to other proof texts personally. Sure. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to to talk about or give some? Well, I think I on? think we I think we went into a lot of a lot of good details. I think that just in sum, the Orthodox believe in several canons. The differences in canons pretty much portray the difference in quality between the books the quality is either prophetic god you know literally word for word breathed out by god or superintended by god those are two different things now the end product is what god wants obviously but the way god gets to that end product is different and the church recognizes this and that's why the church has different canons and that's why the church has saints that explain why these different canons are the way they are i think there's a lot of misinformation for polemical reasons i think it's sort of like a, this post-alignment argument, why Protestants can't understand anything because they can't understand their Bible, whatever, but it's just, right? That's, think about most Orthodox history existed before Protestantism existed. So the whole view of canicity would have not hinged upon polemical demands centuries, <laughs> centuries removed from where, they, where they've where they already discerned this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would just want to challenge the audience is we have to look at when we read saints, when we read the scriptures, not to read them according to modern presuppositions and, and modern concerns. Because you really screw up history, you really screw up scriptures, you really screw up the hagiographic witness to witness the saints when you do that. And I think when people start unpacking their presuppositions and their modern concerns, that doesn't mean they're bad concerns, but like just concerns that weren't relevant to like the text you're reading, you start realizing like, oh, can it's not what I think it is because I'm thinking about this the wrong way or, oh, 
you know, this stuff about the papacy is not what I think it is because what they they meant something different by these words. There's mm-hmm. just so much we import into the past based on just modern stuff. And it takes a lot of immersion, like for the historian or for the Christian to really grapple with this. And so then, well, how do you immerse yourself? You need to have a prayer rule for yourself, which means you have to hold yourself to prayers, whatever it is for you. I mean, Orthodox have their own printed prayer rules, but you need to have prayer rules. You need to have fasting. You need to have daily scripture reading. You actually have to immerse yourself in things of God. And you also need good works, right? So you need to be giving alms. You need to be doing works of righteousness because uh, the book of James says, you know, you flee from Satan, he'll flee from you, right? If we do God's will, right, that attracts the grace of God. And so if we do those things, that's how we immerse ourselves in this so we can understand it. If we don't, if we just, if we just apply ourselves purely intellectually, we're not going to get this. And so that'd be that's my parting words on the issue. Oh, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and then I guess my parting words would be that I think I, I found it quite exciting that we found that the Eastern Orthodox perspective and the Anglican perspective as, as, as formulated in the rudder and then also in this in Article 6 is actually almost identical, really. It's just that we might have some disagreements about how we got to that conclusion, but it's still basically the same. I think the main difference we've, we've found is that, as you said, the Eastern Orthodox view have a hard view of superintendence, whereas Anglicans would have a soft view. But but it's not as much as a difference as maybe we'd, as YouTube pop apologetics would lead people to think. <laughs> so I think that's been, uh, that's, that was quite exciting to find. Because I, I know a lot of people get very stressed out about this issue. And they do have a post-enlightenment obsession with certainty. And it's just a bit silly, isn't it? It's not really. In the Orthodox tradition, bad. when something gives you unease, it's believed that it's from the demons. And so mm. the demons want to sow doubt because they don't want you reading the scriptures, right? So, like, if you read your Bible, and it's 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 good, like, right? Like, it's good if you've got the translation you like or if you like the Masoretic text or you like this up to it. It's good, like, you have your preferences, right? But that's not what saves you, right? If you're reading your Bible and you're simply spending time with God, you're, you're simply letting yourself be open to what you want God to teach you. It's not going to matter what the translation is, as in it's NRSV, it's it's NIV, it's NASB, whatever you're using. Um, it's the Orthodox Study Bible, whatever. It's not going to matter if it's Masoretic or if it's Septuagint. It doesn't mean it's it's not important all the time, right? There's certain passages that I think in Septuagint are absolutely necessary because they're Christological. But the point is, if you're not delving into all that, the grace of the Spirit is going to overcome that stuff. Right. And that's and that's what we don't think about. That's why I, I can read from the rudder where it says this stuff I didn't even read where they talk about how no version of the Septuagint is absolutely correct. Right. So, like, we don't have a scripture word for word where everything's absolutely correct. We're not like mm-hmm. the Muslims of the Quran. We don't believe that exists. But mm-hmm. we believe in a very big God. He could overcome this. You know, in the West, they had the Vulgate for a thousand years. God, they did just fine with the Vulgate. You know, the Orthodox had a somewhat deficient Septuagint. And I can say somewhat because most of it's actually very good. But I think the Book of Job has some issues and and, and whatnot. And there's certain passages I'd say, uh, that the footnote gets into from St. Nicodemus um, that point to where the Septuagint can't be correct in certain, you know, textual critical aspects. The point is the grace of God is more important than that. You know, God's not going to let you really pursuing them with the right motives in the church to go totally awry because you you read the wrong rendering, the wrong words. They got the wrong. Mm. They put the definite article and they should have inferred that there was no definite article there or whatever. Right. We obsess over this stuff and we obsess over this wrongly because the idea is to, is to put doubt in our minds, to trust the authority of God's word. That's what Satan wants, and that's what we have to reject. That's what we have to deny. We have to have confidence that when we're approaching God in prayer and the scriptures, it doesn't matter if we have the perfect words, right? You pray to God and you don't have the perfect words. doesn't mean God don't listen to you, right? It's not like it's a, a magical spell and you get the wrong word. Their prayer is now irrelevant, right? You know, 
the Holy Spirit intercedes for you. And the same way the Holy Spirit intercedes in your interpretation of the scriptures, despite the deficiencies in text type and translation, etc. Um, and so that's why I think these, these arguments of doubt because of epistemic certainty are spiritually very dangerous. That's right. I think it, it applies also to, as we've mentioned at the beginning, things like differences in the gospel accounts or differences between Chronicles and Kings. And some people can get very upset about that. And it can actually even d sort of destroy people's faith if they get too obsessive at all. They go, oh, the Bible is, is contradictory, and therefore it can't be true. Or even if you just look at differences of emphases, like between St. John and St. Peter, they obviously just have slightly different ways of understanding soteriology, of understanding the gospel message at its core. For Paul, it's, I would argue, it's justification by faith alone. Whereas for John, it seems to be rebirth, spiritual rebirth, as they're sort of two big things. And that's not a contradiction. And people shouldn't get too upset about that. Uh, we just let the grace of God speak to us through scripture, and he speaks to us through a multitude of voices and translation types and canon lists as well. Uh, oh, I did actually have one question for you, Craig, before we go. Okay. It's a throwaway question. Yeah. Um, in the... New Testament, because of the majority text, we have some additions. So, for instance, you know, in First John 5, it talks about the three witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, or in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, there's that inserted yep. pericope about the woman caught in adultery. I think there's a few others here and there. What are, you, what are your thoughts on those? Are they scripture? Are they superintended traditional witnesses to something that just got added in? Or what do you do? I personally think they're actually all authentic, but not for like that sort of King James only reason. It's mm -hmm. like, for example, the longer ending of Mark is quoted by St. Irenaeus. So even if our earliest version of Mark from the from a fourth man, ma, century manuscript is lacking it, it's the ending of a book. So that's actually very common with manuscripts because it's when you're unrolling them or it's the last page in a book, it could get yeah. damaged. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, the longer ending is missing because it got damaged and it fell out. Right? You know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. rocket science. We have the longer ending in a second century source, which means it pre-exists our, our earliest witness to a, a shorter ending. So, like, sometimes we could dispense with some of these, like, odd critical arguments with just better evidence that if people appreciated the patristic witness more, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, with First John 5, 7, not only do we have... Uh, it quoted by St. Cyprian. He doesn't quote it as scripture, but it doesn't mean, right? Uh, writers do that all the time. They just quote scriptures. They don't, they don't always say the scripture says. Mm -hmm. So he's quoting it thinking it's there. And uh, St. Ambrose in the next century says it only started being removed by Arian copyist, right? So we actually have a motive. Now, he could be wrong, right? He could be just making it up. But the point is, at least we have some historical basis to believe that First John 5, 7 is original. Um, I think a more interesting argument could be made for the inauthenticity of the Pericope adultery. Um, mostly because we have so several witnesses. We have versions of the Gospel of Luke with it. We got versions of the Gospel of John without it. We got versions of the Gospel of John with it. And so my opinion, and, and oh yeah, and St. Irenaeus mentions that it's a story from St. Papias. Right, so that kind of gives you an indication of where if it was just in the Gospel of John, wouldn't St. Irenaeus just say so? Like, why is he ascribe it to St. Papias? And my opinion is this. Here's my way of harmonizing everything. You ready? Sure. Um, St. Papias lived when St. John is still alive. St. John lived so long. And it's possible that the final version of the Gospel of John we have might even be finished after John's death by his disciples, because it even kind of implies that where, you know, when yes. Jesus said he, you know, he wouldn't die, well, it just mean he didn't say he really wouldn't die, right? Like, so that's something you write when someone's dead. Mm -hmm. So you already have that. You already have two endings to the Gospel of John in the version we have, right? It, it, it talks about all the books in the world and the second ending and the first one. It said it's written so that we may believe. Um, so it already shows indications that probably St. John wrote the first version and the version we have is actually the second updated version from his disciples. And maybe those disciples were the ones who inserted the Pericope Adultery from Papias because maybe Papias got that from St. John. And they're like, well, why is this missing? We got to add this. And so this may explain why we have versions without it because it was from a copy that where the 
disciples didn't insert it yet, and they have a version with it where they did insert it. And there's really no contradiction with this. The chronology meets a works out, and we have the indications within the Gospel of John itself that it's that, that it had at least a single revision. I mean, I think that's pretty hard to argue textually that's not the case. We don't know with epistemic certainty, but just looking at this textually, we have that. And so people go, uh-oh, well, that means there's a part of Gospel of John not written by John. Well, the whole Gospel of Mark's not written by Peter. So, like, I, I just don't see where this is problematic, honestly. Sure. Um, yeah. But at least I could I can respect someone saying, I think there was a version of the Gospel of John written by John without the Pericope Adultery. And I'd say the... The historical probability is very high for that. But that does not mean there's no canonical version without it. Okay. And then, uh, uh, j just if you could answer quickly, it just, just rem that kind of leads to another question that is actually fairly important. Some people will get a bit weird about this, but in terms of the inspired text, what is the inspired text? Is it is it the original autograph written by the writer? Or is it... A certain manuscript tradition, like the KJV only as say, which is I think they say the majority text is yeah. the or the Byzantine text. So is that that's the same thing? Is that's the inspired word of God? Or how do you go about that? Well, yeah, go, going from what we read in the footnote in the rudder, it's there's it's the autographs. Obviously, those were prophetic word for word the way they ought to be. Mm -hmm. And there's historical details and stuff, um, or or narration details from the author, which are superintended, and so they're not prophetic. And so, being that that's the case, then that kind of permits us to have this sort of dichotomy you're posing. Is that like I don't know where I'm going with this anymore. I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So the the autograph is the inspired word, yeah. but God superintends the manuscript traditions. Yes, and so that's and why I think you could have a de facto version of the of a Aramaic targum in the Septuagint for the Book of Job, and it's not the end of the world, you know. And you could have uh, the Vulgate, and it doesn't always translate the Proto Masoretic as perfectly as it could, in my opinion. Um, or you could have the Septuagint. And it's better in more respects than the Masoretic text. And but doesn't mean if what you had was the Masoretic text, which was translated into Russian, by the way, by Saint Philaret, so he obviously found it profitable. Um, you know, doesn't mean then you're up the the creek and you shouldn't read the Masoretic text because we view God preserved these things and saints endorsed these things. Then that's in, superintended by God Himself. Do you put a special emphasis on the majority text, or not? Uh, my Personally, my emphasis is on the Septuagint for the Old Testament. I do make my own specific exceptions. I do think the Masoretic text for the Book of Job is clearly superior. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, with the New Testament, it's I, the majority text would be the one I emphasize. Uh, it's what the New King James uses, for example. It's yeah, what the King James uses, and it's just it's just more popular in the Orthodox tradition. Um, and and the things that are missing don't seem to be missing for very good reasons, honestly. Sure. Like you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, of course, the King James is written by the Anglican Church, so I think Anglicans have a special affinity with the majority text. I did find it interesting that the Orthodox Study Bible, the New Testament, is actually just the New King James version. So there you now, go. some of these things are due to publishers, and they do it for royalties. <laughs> Uh, right, so we got to be careful with stuff like that because there yeah. are certain there's several translations of New King James where in the Orthodox Study Bible they take particular issue with particularly the error how the aorist tense is used in the Book of Romans, which I I would concur with some of their critiques. Um, yeah, you kind of wish they went all the way and did and also did a Orthodox translation of the New Testament, but I'm sure they I'm sure they will eventually do that and it'll be mm -hmm. a reason to sell people more books. <laughs> <laughs> um okay well so before you go craig do you want to just uh plug your channel stuff that you're up to what you want people to be aware of etc yeah it's uh check out uh just put in youtube orthodox christian theology check out my channel uh i i don't know when this is going to debut i have a cartoon that's coming out so it's called the schisms it's about a family that goes into schism and so i like to think i'm gonna an apologist that actually 
has more than one trick in his bag. I'll do, I did a documentary with the other Paul. I did mm -hmm. uh, this cartoon with Bible Illustrated. I've written a, a biblical commentary that I'm trying to get published. Uh, I'm writing a history book right now in the history of the papacy. I, I talk about several different topics. Um, and like I said, I, I'm, I, I have a blog, orthodoxchristiantheology.com, where I get into a lot of detail. So I, I don't just pontificate on YouTube, but I can't actually put pen to paper. You know, it's, there's a lot of different stuff that I do, and it's with the point of exposing people, uh, particularly the heterodox, the orthodox theology, what orthodox believe. And um, it's just a, a good way to get started. Uh, but more important than like my stuff, would be uh, to support the evangelistic work in Cambodia if you're Orthodox and you're listening to this, to go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. And that supports the mission in Cambodia. Um, and pray, because to be honest, I don't like being like the financial middleman of this stuff. I'm, you know, I got other stuff to do than be the treasurer for these churches in Cambodia. Please pray we can figure out a way to directly send money to them without sending to the United States first. It's very difficult because between economic sanctions on the Russians and scams in Eastern European countries where then they don't have like PayPal and stuff there that like we only could send money through like MoneyGram and stuff. And then I have to be the one who does it. And so it's right. yeah. like, I, I really don't want to do it. So even if you just pray for me and pray that the financial situation in Cambodia gets a little more efficient and more direct to them, it just saves me work. Every penny you donate goes to the churches of Cambodia. And I guess the reason I tell that story is because I really don't want to be doing this. I don't want your money. <laughs> it's, it's for the churches in Cambodia. So if you want to support evangelistic work, don't just listen to YouTube videos and stuff. Do something important and support the uh, the churches of Cambodia. Make converts and support um, support churches that are growing in a in a majority Buddhist country. Cool. Thanks for that. We'll have those links below. If this video comes out after your cartoon, we'll have the link for that video in the description. As there well. you go. <laughs> so yeah, cartoon. Uh, check those out, people. Craig, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you for blessing us with your, with your wisdom and knowledge about this issue. It's been a great conversation. And um, I'm sure we'll talk again sometime, either in your neck of the woods or mine. Um, well, hopefully then, yours. Hopefully yours. So I, I want to do less videos on my own channel. So okay. maybe we'll do yours cool. again. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah. All right. Well, um, until then, God bless you, Craig, and God, God bless our viewers. Goodbye.